Hello everyone, uh, my name is Russell Brooks, the Associate Director for Executive Education and Online Learning here at LSE and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today our third in a series of five webinars on the theme of skills for a post-COVID-19 world as part of the LSE Festival this week. Um, in this webinar series we are considering the professional skills that you need for success in a post-COVID world from a multidisciplinary perspective. And each day we're joined by LSE faculty, the LSE faculty who are involved in our portfolio of online certificate courses, who will be discussing research trends in their field, as well as practical ways to upskill your professional capabilities uh, to meet the future challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for us in the coming months. You'll also have your chance to pose questions to the speakers from LSE in each session. It's great that we can see in, in some of you have been with us for the first two days and everyone's got, we've got the hang of it now. We've been asking people as I read the introduction to just let us know in the chat where you're from. So welcome to you all. It's great to have another global audience um, of, of participants. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rebecca Newton, Professor Sandy Pepper and Dr. Emma Sohn, who will be talking to us on the topic of leadership and change. Effective leadership is essential in any organization and particularly in this uncertain world. Resilient leaders are now more important than ever to the survival and success of a business. And in this session, they will discuss how you can use the dynamics of authentic and transformational leadership to change organizations for the better. So Rebecca is an organizational psychologist and senior visiting fellow in the Department of Management at LSE. She has spent 20 years researching and teaching on leadership, change, organizational culture, and management practice. Rebecca is a coach and advisor to leadership teams across the globe and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Change Management, is the author of Authentic Gravitas, Who Stands Out and Why, and is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review. Sandy Pepper is a professor of management practice at LSE, he was previously a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where he held various senior management roles. His research and teaching interests include organizations and management theory, with a particular focus on the theory of the firm and corporate governance. Sandy is also interested in behavioral and new institutional economics, business ethics, business history, and the relationship between management theory and practice. And finally, Emma is an assistant professor of management at LSE and of course, and, and um, leads LSE's uh, leading risk management uh, executive education course. Her research examines how individual differences, team working and organizational environments influence decisions, performance and risk taking. Emma's projects include studies of decision processes in financial decision making, healthcare, IT, and television production. Emma has extensive fieldwork experience in public and private sector organizations, including government departments, local government, NHS hospitals, manufacturing, and top tier investment banks. As a team, Rebecca, Sandy, and Emma are the course conveners for our brand new online certificates course, Leadership and Change. And I'm sure you will agree, uh, we couldn't ask for a more stellar team to lead us through today's event. Um, in, in a moment, I'll hand over to, to the three of them to lead, talk you through. Um, as in on Monday and Tuesday, uh, Rebecca, Sandy and Emma will talk until around 20 to 1, uh, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask any questions. If you'd like to ask a question, then I'd ask you to pop it in the Q&A box, um, and then I will try and get as many of them to the panel as I can during the last part of the session. So. Thanks very much to Rebecca, Sandy and Emma, and I'm gonna hand over to Rebecca to start us. Wonderful, thanks so much, Russell. And welcome everybody. It's great to have you with us here at Virtual LSE from all over the world. We are delighted to spend this time with you today. Um, as Russell mentioned, the three of us, Sandy, Emma and myself have been working together closely. And in light of the changes and the challenges with the pandemic have been considering what effective leadership looks like in a world of work that's rapidly and drastically changing. 
And so we thought it might be interesting to share some of the ideas that we've been talking about with you today. So we're going to have a look at what we've learned, what we take away, and how we can help organizations to deal with ongoing challenges. So why don't we start, you know, we're talking about effective leaders in the context of organizational change. Emma, why don't we start with the notion of effective leadership? Can you share with us what it means to be a transformational leader? Yes, sure. Thank you, Rebecca. And welcome, everybody, to this webinar. It's great to see we've got such an international audience. I'm going to be focusing on transformational leadership. And this is a way of thinking about leadership, which is applicable in all of your contexts. Now, transformational leadership is a process whereby leaders engage with and influence others by paying attention to their needs, by raising their motivation and providing an ethical framework for decisions. So in doing so, transformational leaders create change within people. We think about the term transformation as being one that refers to transforming organizations. And certainly it plays that role. And we'll be discussing that more throughout this webinar. But what we're also talking about here is how transformational leaders help people to fulfill their potential by enabling them to reach their goals in a way that benefits people in their employees, but also it benefits the organizations and the societies which the organizations are operating in. So when we think about examples of transformational leaders, we can see key figures from history like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, but we can also think about current figures like New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who exemplifies this kind of leadership and talks so much about empathy and how we need empathy to be a strong leader. We can also think about Satya Nadella, who is the head of Microsoft. And in his tenure since 2014, he's created something of a change in the strategy. He's transformed the culture into something that we see as being more inclusive, focusing on learning and personal growth, but also he has tripled the stock price of Microsoft since he took office. So we need to contrast this though with other forms of leadership or management. And here we can draw a couple of contrasts. So one is between transformational leadership in the way I've just described it and transactional leadership, which is where leaders just focus on the transactions between getting work done and getting reward when you meet a goal. Now, the thinking here is that those transactions, they matter. People need to know what goals they're working towards. They need to know what they can achieve when they meet those goals. But if you only focus on transactions, then performance will never be exceptional. It will just be an ordinary kind of performance. People need more than that. They need that kind of growth and engagement that transformational leaders can offer. So that's one distinction. A second distinction that's important to draw is between transformational leadership and what is called pseudo transformational leadership. So this is where we might have people that position themselves as a leader. They might often be quite charismatic people and seem to create a compelling vision that influences people towards particular goals. But the focus here is on the person themselves. It, it's more like a cult of personality. Um, these people are more self-interested, maybe quite willing to exploit people to achieve their goals and not guided by a moral compass. So we've got transformational leadership and how that brings benefits, but also we contrast that with either more regular forms of transaction or a more personally focused form of pseudo transformational leadership, which is not the same thing at all. Mm. I think we can have a really interesting discussion about pseudo transformational leadership. I'm sure the chat would go crazy here. Um, that's it's really interesting. Let's stay on the topic of, of effective leadership. So how does a leader become transformational? So it's positioned as a skills model and the way that it's originally presented is here is a set of skills that you can learn and the more you enact these skills, the more effective you'll be as a transformational leader. Now, of course, some skills are easier for us to learn than others and some of them will more naturally suit our personal style and strengths than others. But essentially, we are looking at five areas of skill and what connects them is values and the way that people position themselves in relation to other people. So we've got five areas here. 
Um, the first one is building trust. So creating um, yourself as somebody that people actually want to follow. Do you have a vision which people can understand, they can appreciate, maybe they've participated in developing that vision? And so they trust you as a leader to take them somewhere that's going to bring benefits. The second area is acting with integrity. So do leaders talk about values? And this is an interesting one because I do a lot of work with people assessing their transformational leadership and they believe that they're talking about values but people often say, no, you're not really discussing them. It doesn't mean they don't have values and Sandy's gonna talk about this shortly, but we do need to articulate values because they're so important as guiding frameworks for the decisions and choices that people make. The third area is encouraging others and motivation is something we talk a lot about when we think about what leaders do. What's particularly challenging in current times, of course, is motivating people when times are hard or uncertain. And here we focus on the way that transformational leaders can enable people through giving them resources. And the three of us will talk about different ways that we can do this, but one example is to help to educate people and give them confidence. And it's not an empty confidence, it's a belief which is based on coaching and development so that people are able to complete their roles. We also have innovative thinking. So this is leaders encouraging people to think differently, to challenge perspectives. And this of course is critical to effective decision-making which is so important in our current situation. And we have coaching and developing others and how that helps them to learn. So all of these elements are very important in times of change and uncertainty, and they will remain so in the post COVID when we get, if we get to that situation. Um, so what I'll focus on here is innovative thinking, because Rebecca, you're going to be talking about culture and developing people and relationships. And Sandy, you're going to be talking about values and ethics and character which of course are elements of transformational leadership. So if we look at one element that I think is, is particularly interesting and useful to people, it's innovative thinking, which is so important in the diverse and complex and globalized world that we live in. Now here, we've got a few examples of, of ways that we can encourage innovative thinking. So it might be um, re-examining critical assumptions, seeking different perspectives, encouraging people to look at problems from many different angles, and suggesting new, look, new ways of looking at how to complete assignments. And doing so stimulates creative thinking, it helps to draw out diverse perspectives, and it also encourages the quality of the work that people can do. It encourages innovation. Um, a great example I heard of this was in local government, where every few months people would be encouraged to submit ideas about what could be different, how could people in local government serve their citizens better. And what they did was encourage people to pitch ideas, the ideas that were thought to be the, the most useful and beneficial to the citizens would then be given some funds. And they were quite small amounts of money, but things that would make a difference. So for example, one was, this is a very diverse community and people wanted separate facilities to cook vegetarian and non-vegetarian food. So they pitched the idea, it was funded, it makes a difference. So opening up the possibilities creates ways to solve problems. It's great, Emma. I mean, I think all leaders recognize the need for innovation and particularly in such a fast changing environment, like you said, what are the challenges, would you say, what are the challenges for leaders who would like to encourage innovative thinking? Yeah, there are some significant challenges, Rebecca, absolutely. Um, so there are a few that I hear a lot about when talking with, with leaders and managers in organizations. One of them is if I start to ask people for solutions, does that somehow diminish me as a leader? Does it make me seem that I don't know the answers when people expect me to know the answers? And of course, well, one point is thinking about leadership has changed in this sense, in that you know we, we've gone past the idea that the CEO is like a hero in an organization, they have to know it all. Um, and we're moving much more to this, this idea that leaders are people in complex and global and diverse organizations. And in order to be effective, 
what they need to do is to really draw on ideas and it stimulate thinking among other people because it's just not possible for people to be able to solve all the problems. So people sometimes get concerned that, that opening up discussion diminishes them. Now, of course, we need to differentiate here between the responsibilities of a leader. So they will still have responsibility for making decisions and allocating work, resources, and so on to meeting those decisions. But this is where the enhancement is all around. It does enhance the leader because they will be able to understand situations better. They will be able to connect with people better because they're inviting those solutions, but also they generate higher quality decisions. So that's one way that we can overcome the problem of whether leaders are diminished. Another challenge is time that sometimes people say, this is a great idea, but we just do not have time. We're too busy fighting fires to, to really think about how we make decisions. So again, a couple of issues around that. One is there is a time investment in educating people to be good decision makers and to educating people into how to express ideas in a way that is useful. That does take some degree of time. However, what you do when you take time to educate people as decision makers is two things. One is you can head off crises so there is less firefighting anyway and the other is when there are crises that are incredibly time sensitive people are better at making decisions anyway. So yes there's a time involvement perhaps initially if you're not used to leading in this way but that will be repaid um, with the quality of the work that people are able to achieve. And I think a third issue is that people often are not very comfortable speaking up. And it's one that leaders often understand, but it, it's an intensely practical point. I'm sure we've all been in situations where you have wanted to raise an idea and you start to speak up and somebody, particularly if they're senior, they just go, oh, you know, a little sigh, they roll their eyes. Well, that has stopped the conversation in its tracks. The people don't feel safe to speak up. And this is, the concept of psychological safety, which was developed by Harvard professor Amy Edmondson. And what she said is people need to be able to speak up without fear of personal risk or of being marginalized or rejected from groups. We need to create environments where people can speak up. And this is where, of course, the idea of a sense of inclusion is so important because it brings people in, but it also engages them with the challenges they're facing and helps them to elevate the work that everybody is focused on. Thank you, Emma. I'm, I'm sure that there are lots of questions. So I, I encourage everyone, if you have questions for Emma about this, then pop them into the chat. I'm just gonna um, flip over to Sandy for a moment. Um, Sandy, I know that you're very interested in um, the interplay between business ethics and leadership. Can you talk to us about that? Sure, thanks, Rebecca. So there are two things that I have been thinking about quite a lot recently. One is corporate purpose and the other is character. Let's start with, with corporate purpose. If you had asked a class of management students um, over, the, over the years, or certainly since I've been teaching at the LSE, what the purpose of a, a company was, they probably would have said something like to, to maximize shareholder value, shareholder value maximization. And um, that would have been a, you know, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, it's been the conventional wisdom in uh, management thinking, business literature, business practice, uh, dating back to at least Milton Friedman in 1970. Um, he wrote a, an article in the New York Times, um, responding to um, a debate that was going on at the time about what social purposes businesses should fulfill. And Milton Friedman said this was all a load of bunkum and that the sole purpose of a company was to maximize value for shareholders. Now, in recent years, uh, people have began to contest that. Uh, there's an interesting project going on at the moment at the British Academy, uh, led by um, Professor Colin Mayer from Oxford, um, looking at the future of the corporation. And the business purpose, purpose of the corporation is a kind of 
key uh, part of, of that project. And then another important event is that in August 2019, the American Business Round Table, uh, which is a, a kind of um, a, a club, a body representing uh, the, the, the leading CEOs of American companies, they uh, reversed their position of many years um, and said that uh, they no longer accept that they no longer believe that shareholder value maximization was the sole purpose of a company and they argued instead that uh, companies should have a greater purpose to promote the general welfare for the good of all stakeholders um, a state a statement if you think about it which is kind of laced with ethical terminology mm. and sandy what would you say what's all this got to do with leadership what are the implications for leaders okay well fair question because that's our topic for today um well um for example, if you were to ask Pascal Sorio, the uh, the CEO of AstraZeneca, um, what drives him at the moment, I think he'd probably talk about global health and saving the world from, from COVID-19. Um, I don't think he would say that he was in the business to maximise shareholder value. Um, certainly the decisions that AstraZeneca has made um, about uh, on a, on a non-profit basis developing uh, the COVID vaccine. I'm, I'm sure in the course of time that will do them well in terms of reputation um, and share value. But in the short term, you know, it wasn't about that. It was about something uh, rather different. Um, you know, leaders don't motivate employees by talking about their passion to make shareholders wealthier. They motivate employees by talking about passions to, I don't know, feed the world if you're a food company like Unilever, save the world if you're AstraZeneca, uh, maybe connect the world if you're Apple or Google. Um, they don't do it by, by talking about shareholder value. And in a much the same way, companies don't attract customers uh, by saying that they want to, to maximize uh, profits for shareholders. They talk about very, you know, positively framed value statements. Now, I recognize we mustn't get carried away here. Um, you know, Facebook's recent debacle with the Australians, um, uh, you know, just sort of puts a, a bit of a, um, a question mark around uh, uh, some of these things. Um, Stefan Stern in the Financial Times recently uh, thought that this corporate purpose stuff was um, rather questionable. Um, the American sociologist, uh, Jerry Davis, who's a man I've got a lot of time for, he re recently wrote an article questioning the sincerity of the Business Roundtable's August 2019 statement. But, you know, this whole notion of, of purpose, and it's not just corporate purpose, it's uh, our individual purposes, uh, the purpose of leaders as well. I think that's really important at the moment. Mm. So, Sandy, talking about this individual level, then you mentioned character earlier. What would you, what about the question of character in all this? So, I, I recognise I've got to be a bit careful here when I'm talking with uh, two psychologists who both have very uh, considerable exper expertise in leadership science. But of course, philosophers have been studying leadership for centuries. Uh, they just call it something else. They talk about virtue eth ethics. Uh, and sometimes about character. So this is where character comes in. So Plato and Aristotle, to name but two, they were fascinated by questions of character and virtue. Plato believed in absolutes, uh, the four cardinal virtues, as he, he called them, wisdom, temperance, courage, and justice. Aristotle had a different perspective. He believed in uh, in equilibriums, in the golden mean. And so for him, the virtues uh, represent some kind of an equilibrium point between different tendencies. So courage, for example, to Aristotle uh, is not an absolute. It's a, it's a balance between recklessness on the one side and discretion on the other side. And Aristotle was also interested in purpose, in individual purpose, our individual you know, purpose, our objective in our lives. He called it telos. And he believed that that was a very important part of, uh, of ethics. 
So to the to, to the ancients, the study of ethics was the study of character. And they they believed in the principle that good things, virtuous things, are things done by good or virtuous people. Very much a a concept that I think um, you know a modern student of leadership uh, would understand. But this was this was kind of lost in philosophy for um, a, a large, a, a sort of huge chunk of time um, from the days of Aristotle and uh, and Plato uh, until the twentieth century. Um, but it was rescued by two uh, lady philosophers, two female philosophers at Somerville College in Oxford, Elizabeth Anscombe and Philippa Foote, um, two more highly intelligent women, by the way, um, and uh, by a number of other uh, uh, 20th century philosophers as well. And, and they brought the study of virtue and the study of character back into vogue. So currently, there's a really fascinating project going on at Oxford University. It's called the Character Project. Uh, it's seeking to address the question, how can students uh, best be equipped to become the kind of responsible values-based leaders uh, that the world desperately needs? Um, and the LSEs uh, uh, become involved in that, in that project as well, because it's, um, you know, it's a very powerful uh, thing to add to the educational offer. Um, an example of what virtue ethics can, uh, can teach leaders. So I was rather struck recently by the story of uh, KPMG, where uh, the, the UK CEO, uh, Bill Michaels, had to stand down after telling staff to stop moaning about the, the pandemic. And I was rather struck by this. Um, curiously, you may think, I... I started with some sympathy for Bill Michaels uh, because I think sometimes it's really important for leaders to be very honest and to you know to tell it how it is. Um, but Aristotle would have counselled um, about the importance of balancing this kind of tough love with an equal dose of compassion and empathy. You know, we all know that the the, the last twelve months have been extraordinarily difficult for people and uh, they're grieving and they're lamenting uh, the times that the time that's been lost um, and so you know you need both empathy and tough love if you're going to really effectively communicate uh, that kind of message so there's a bit of a theme developing here um, KPMG have wisely I think appointed two women to their top leadership positions to replace um, the rather alpha male leadership style uh, that Bill Michaels was reputed to have. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they were probably quite wise to do that. Sandy, thanks so much. It's so interesting to make the connections between leadership and ethics and character because historically, people have tended to think about leadership as the exercise of power. Whereas of course we realize it's so much more than that, um, both personally, but also in the environments we create. So thank you, Sandy, for that. We'll pick up on those points in the discussion, I'm sure. But Rebecca, let's turn to you now and, and let's hear your thoughts on what you think the key issues are in terms of women in leadership and inclusion. Yeah, thanks, Emma, and thanks, Sandy. So many interesting points to, to raise in our discussion. Um, okay, so in, for inclusion for women and actually for all non-dominant groups, it's one of the more critical aspects of organisational culture today. So let's pull back for a second and, and first think about culture in general and then look more specifically at inclusion. You know, culture is a vital element of organisational success. We know that culture and performance are linked um, and I guess there's two key points that I'd make here regarding the role of an effective leader. Firstly is ownership of the fact that leaders largely shape culture and secondly that culture can and even should change. So let's start with the first one, that culture is largely shaped by leaders. Um, you know many organisations have clear values so they're almost always on websites and sometimes in office buildings when we could go into office buildings um, for those of us who can inside office buildings you know you might see them in 
in glossy writing on the walls or doors. Um, one of the things, so this is important and, and companies are proud of their values, which is a good thing. It can, however, make it feel as though culture is something that is set and is imposed on us by the organization or by the most senior person or people and that we have no control over it, potentially, therefore, maybe no responsibility for it. Um, but as one of my clients recently said to me, culture is what happens every day. You know, so we can think of culture in terms of these values that we see declared by organizations, but it's also about policies and processes and very much about behaviors. You know, it's what we see demonstrated. So how people show up, how people engage, how we take decisions, how much risk we feel we can take, how we work together, how we get work done. That's what makes up culture. And leaders obviously have a huge role in influencing these factors. So through their own behaviours, leaders can send a message around how others should behave in this particular team or this particular organisation through what they personally say or what they don't say, how they say things, what they reward, what they challenge, what they celebrate, what they don't. Um, you know, Sandy spoke about Bill Michael's comments and him stepping down. Let's look at this through the lens of culture. So, you know, we know that leaders shape culture and if a leader's behavior or communication doesn't reflect a company's values or that it is, those values that it aspires to outwork, then we have a problem. And a significant trend that we've seen in recent years is that we see leaders being held to account much more for their cultures by all stakeholders, by employees, as well as by the media, by society. Um, so I, I think the first thing that I would say for everyone who is a leader or who aspires to leader is to know that you can shape culture and you should. Uh, we can feel that culture is the responsibility of HR. You know, typically culture has sat, sat in the organizational bucket of HR or the, the people function of the business. And absolutely HR has an important role to play in working alongside and in partnering with leaders to shape and to shift culture. Um, but as I, one of my recent HBR articles, I wrote that HR can't shape company culture by itself. So even if the directive comes from the CEO to the head of HR or people to shift the culture, if we don't have ownership of that culture shaping and culture shift across the leadership team of an organization, we won't, we won't see a genuine change, a meaningful change. And the pandemic has really brought this to life that effective leaders are intentional in shaping and in shifting culture. And then the, the second point on this is that culture can and it should change. You know, we can think that a strong culture is one that's fixed. So we've been like this for more than 100 years or however many decades. But as the world changes and the workplace changes and organisational strategic objectives change, culture needs to change too, to align with the new direction and to facilitate the achievement of, strate of strategic goals. And, and we've seen this over the last year through the pandemic. So the workplace has changed so rapidly and organisations have pivoted their strategy so quickly in response to this. But sometimes we feel that culture change can be a slow burn um, and it can be, but the call to action on certain points, such as inclusion, like you mentioned, are stronger than ever. And in some organisations, we need culture to change really rapidly as well. Rebecca, I think that's it's absolutely fascinating because people can often think about culture as being something which is rather static. Like you say, we've, we've been like this for decades. Why do we need to change or, or what can we do, practically speaking? How do we change culture? Um, I'm sure we'll have some really interesting discussion about that later on. But let's focus on this uh, issue of inclusion that you've picked up on a few times as being something that's so critical during our current situation. Tell us, Rebecca, what does culture change in terms of inclusion look like? Yeah, okay, great, Emma. So, um, you know, I mean, every organisation is different, obviously, but there are some common themes, not just across industries, but even across countries. So if we have a look at this case for inclusion, um, what, we can deep dive into, say, the case for inclusion of women in the workplace, for example. We can use that as a mini case study. You know, and Sandy, you mentioned that we should have more women in leadership. Absolutely. Yes, we should. Um, 
we know that women in business has a positive impact on performance. Okay. You know, for example, a recent McKinsey study that came out, I think they studied around a thousand companies in over 12 countries, and they found that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on their exec teams are 21% more likely than other firms to report above average profitability. So, you know, that's just one example. There are many studies demonstrating the link between women in business, particularly women in leadership. A lot of the studies look at women in leadership and business performance. Um, you know, on a, I was running a gender inclusion leadership program recently that was fascinating, wonderful. And one participant said, you know, we often talk about gender inclusion is not just the right thing to do. It's also good business. And then there's all these stats that we know about of, of women in leadership and performance. And she said, let's flip that around, right? We know that this is good for business and it's just the right thing to do as well, right? So gender, it, creating equal opportunities, gender parity, parity in general, um, but we are actually so far from that. So, you know, the, the, if we look globally, the best national examples, and I encourage you to think about in, in your own countries, I know people are, are coming in from everywhere around the world right now. Um, you know, the, the best examples, the best national averages around the world of women in boards is around about 30% at best. Okay, so we're making progress, but I would say not enough and not fast enough. We need to be very strategic. Leaders need to be very strategic about not just where they want to get to, but how they're going to get to. Lots of organizations I know have these goals for by 2030, we want to get here. Yes, and we need real strategies and leaders who are committed to driving change in order for that to be a reality. You know, the World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report last year, which looks at a number of factors, suggested that gender gaps can be potentially closed in 54 years in Western Europe, just to take some examples, 107 years in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and 151 years in North America. That last one in particular reflecting the lack of progress that was made last year when we're thinking about the impact of this pandemic on um, women in business and women in leadership, you know, and these are the figures if we continue at the current pace. So we desperately need leaders who will drive change and who will drive significant and meaningful and rapid change. Um, and it's not just about representation, right, which is that, for example, in this case, the number of women in positions in leadership. It's also about inclusion and inclusion is part of culture. Inclusion is not something that should sit in the DEI bucket of an organization. If, if culture is owned by leaders, then inclusion is owned by leaders. Um, one study in tech, for example, found that 40% of women in tech leave after 10 years compared to 17% of men. And there are lots of misconceptions about why women leave work. So what the study found, it wasn't because they didn't enjoy it and it wasn't because of family reasons that they were leaving. The researchers found that it was largely because of workplace conditions, because of a sense of feeling that their career had stalled or undermining behaviour from their manager. So it's about culture and it's about inclusion. You've made a very compelling case there for the need to change culture and to ramp up the pace at which people change culture. So let's hear some insights from you into how leaders can shape culture so that it becomes more inclusive. Yes. OK, great. So I think I'm a big believer that that we need, you know, I think that one of the reasons that leaders don't um, shape culture as actively as they could is that they don't actually know what to do like don't have have any training and development in that so that's the first point is to make sure that we're equipping leaders to do this so some of the things that we know make a difference and particularly when it comes to a culture of inclusion uh, to ensure that there is transparency and accountability you know to to get the data for their for every leader's area of the business but actually what the research has found is it's not enough to have the data we know that that data needs to be monitored and it needs to be shared. So for your organizations, I'd think, how are we monitoring this data and how are we sharing this? Um, another thing that's powerful is, is mentorship, but, but particular aspects of mentorship. So what's happened in recent years is that mentorship has become more accessible. So lots of people are having access to mentoring. 
but there is still a significant difference when it comes to sponsorship. Now, so mentorship in terms of, you know, how are you feeling with this? What are the challenges that you're facing? Um, let me share my experiences with you. That's great that that's happening, but there is a difference we know between who is being sponsored and sponsorship is, oh, I know you're interested in this. Let me put you forward for this. Hey, have you met this person? I think that it would be great to connect you. This would be good for your career. So sp leaders need to sponsor um, everybody. We need equality in sponsorship. And I'd really encourage you to look at sponsorship of women and other non-dominant groups where we need to bring more equality and inclusion. Allyship is really important. We're, we're talking a lot about allyship with leaders right now. So um, choosing to take on the interests of others, particularly um, the interests of, of non-dominant groups and, and just choosing to be an ally and what that means. Um, I, I guess psychological safety, you know, Emma, you mentioned this, it's so important to create an environment where people feel safe to speak up and they feel safe to have a different viewpoint, but also where it's safe to be curious safe to ask questions. So look around. If you're thinking how psychologically safe is my environment, are people sharing different viewpoints and do are they just asking lots of questions? Are they able to be curious or do they feel that um, there might be, be judgment or, or risk of that? And then ultimately what I'd say is that leaders you know, as leaders, we all need to choose a learning approach, right? So we can be afraid, you know, particularly when it comes to some of these issues, we can be afraid of getting it wrong. And it can feel difficult and it can even feel uncomfortable to engage in topics like this, to engage in starting to think about how to shift culture, how to engage in the conversation and take action around inclusion. Um, it can feel difficult or uncomfortable to try out new behaviours, you know, to be more authentic as a leader, to be transformational, to fuel innovation, that can feel challenging. It certainly can feel uncomfortable to start rethinking corporate purpose and character and ethics. What if I'm not a <laughs> um, guru like Sandy? You know, how can we start thinking about this and what it means for our business? It can feel uncomfortable and and um, we can be afraid of that, you know, and, and what all of these things mean for our organisational life today. So ultimately, effective leaders embrace these challenging topics and they are courageous. You know, we know from research that um, courage and integrity, which both of you have touched on, are actually two of the strongest, um, the researchers call it virtuous predictors of leadership performance. So we need leaders who are willing to embrace these challenging um, factors who are courageous and who are really taking ownership for driving meaningful change. So I think I'm going to stop there. And Russell, why don't we hand over to the audience, bring in some people, open up the conversation. Brilliant. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Emma. We um, we covered a, a lot of ground there all, all, um, on some very, very topical and pertinent points. So thank you so much. Thank you to those of you who've already started sending questions in. Um, the first person to ask a question was Alicia, um, and uh, this one came in Emma whilst whilst you were talking. So um, I might throw it to you initially. And Alicia's question was, I find I'll have a real problem finding the balance between opening up to ideas from I, this was from within her uh, her team organisation, I think, and then getting lots of ideas back that are perhaps well, she's described them as fairly useless, but I guess and, and kind of challenging that then need to be dealt with in a very serious, sensitive manager, manner without upsetting and insulting people. How do you, so I, the question is, how do you ensure that the ideas you come up with are more valuable? And I guess perhaps how do you manage sort of some of the ideas that you're not, you're not quite so sure are the right ones for the organization? I think that's a great question um, and certainly a good starting point for our discussion. Yes, there tends to be, um, a time and practice element here certainly and if it's not something that you're used to doing you know opening up to having people's involvement there will be steps along the way um, but there are a couple of things we need to think about there one is um, what are the skills that you need yourself and key here to the success is being open and comfortable yourself with hearing different perspectives because sometimes people are reluctant to invite opinions because they feel quite threatened by what they get they feel personally threatened 
by any suggestions that perhaps what they're doing is not the best or right approach. So I think one step is to look at your own value and perspective of yourself. You know, do you value the opinions of others? And are you comfortable with people saying, I think we should do things completely differently, for example. So look at that first of all, and then think about what are the processes. So when you're working with other people, let's say in team meetings, the focus might be very much, what do we need to do in this meeting? And if we think about these aspects of leadership that we've been discussing, they also require you to open up and talk and encourage people to debate, what are we doing as a team? How do we work together? What are we about? And, and what are the processes? So again, that requires a degree of confidence in your leadership to do that, but also it's helping people to practice. What's it like to raise my suggestions? And then we get to the point that, that we've talked about and Rebecca just closed on around this psychological safety. How do we create an environment where people can really speak up? So there we have a number of skills. As I said earlier, we could do something that we think is almost imperceptible, like just, oh, you know, a little droop of the shoulders or a sigh, which implies, oh, no, not again. I don't want to hear that idea. But the thinking here is, OK, let's just get all the ideas on the table and then evaluate them. And as you proceed, what you can do is help people to understand what are the frameworks for these ideas so that they become more useful. And once you start to embed these practices, you find that you can enact them in a whole range of situations because typically we're not just working with one team, we're working in multiple teams. So you can start to embed them throughout your, your leadership and in the different contexts that you're working within. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Emma. So, so then, so turning turning to Sandy, there was you, you obviously were, were talking around corporate purpose, and I think one of the questions that's coming from Julian is is perhaps around um, how do you distinguish or, or be avoid the trap between what might appear to be rhetoric uh, or to just what might be rhetoric to justify what he calls perpetuating sorry perpetuating damaging behaviour versus sort of something that's more sincere and, and credible. So could you perhaps just talk a bit about that balance for us? So I, I, um, I understand the question and I don't want to be starry eyed about this, but equally, I think it's in, incredibly important not to be uh, cynical about it either. Um, there is a debate going on in the business community um, and amongst business academics and politicians about corporate purpose. Um, and I think we should really encourage that debate. Um, the, the, some of the statements that have been made, um, yeah, they may be, uh, there may be elements of sort of rhetoric and good PR, if you like, about them. Uh, but they, uh, they're, they're said in the context of uh, an increasing kind of demand from society and from customers that the old paradigm of focusing solely on making money um, just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, shareholder value maximization um, has not uh, cured, um, uh, solved the pandemic problem, uh, nor is it going to solve climate change. So I think we should really sort of celebrate the fact that this debate is going on. It's, it's, it, you know, it's not completed. It's only just started. But I think we should celebrate the fact that people are talking about What's the purpose of a business? And we should really encourage uh, business people to, uh, you know, to, to, to think about articulating things in a different way from they've done it in the past. Brilliant, thanks, Sandy. So, so, so Rebecca, I'll come, come to you now. Um, there's, there's a question coming from, from James, who's said, given the new way of working where we can only see our line reports remotely and some we've only ever seen remotely, do you have a top tip for helping teams feel engaged, motivated, um, and that they have a voice to, to speak up? And I guess I might just add to that, if I can, obviously the comments um, from the like, golden, uh, leaders of Goldman Sachs over the weekend, where this idea that they couldn't build, everyone had to return to the office, because, almost implying it was impossible to build a culture of collaboration virtually. I mean, how, how would you sort of respond to, to James and perhaps what's coming out of some of the leaders, particularly in the finance industry at the moment? Yeah, I think that's a really great question, James. Um, it's, I think one thing that I'm seeing is that, you know, when we work virtually, 
we often go straight from small talk before everyone joins the meeting, you know, so we're chatting about weekends or whatever's happening and, and things like that. And then we're jumping straight into the, the agenda points of the meeting. And I think what's missing, I, I think of this kind of space in the middle, which is the bigger business conversations and the bigger team conversations um, and making sure that we're carving out windows for that. So whether it's at the start of, you know, ultimately we're talking about feeling connected. Now, connectedness is so important. You know, some of the neuroscience research, I think, shows that when people have a sense of social isolation, that it reduces their executive, their cognitive functioning, including their ability to deal with novelty and, and everything is changing so quickly. So we need people. So we connectedness, this is why James's question is so important. We need to make sure as leaders that we are carving out meaningful time for team conversations and for um, bigger business, not, not just on, yes, on the personal front, but also on the business front in terms of, um, you know, how we're feeling about work and how making sure that we're continuing to communicate vision and to invite people to contribute to new business strategies and to engage them in this way. And so I think it's about leaders needing to be really strategic with, if you look at the week and you look at the month, think of how much time is actually spent in those bigger business slash team conversations. Um, that's one thing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of organizations are doing team workshops and, and development workshops and things like that now I think when we when we first hit everyone you know back early 2020 everyone put everything on hold and thought okay well we'll just wait until we're back and then when it was apparent that that was more uncertain you know than we had imagined now people have just started doing that so they absolutely are building in um, these virtual experiences to pick up on the point of whether we can collaborate virtually. I mean, I would say that we can, I, I spend a lot of time working in collaboration and, and helping organizations drive collaboration. The first thing is well done everybody for thinking about how to drive collaboration. Cause it's actually an easy topic to take off the cards when there's so much pressure and stress and other things that need to get done. So that's a good thing. I think we just need to be careful. So some of the organizations I'm talking to, one of the concerns is that it actually could lead to more exclusion if it becomes, if we get a bigger segregation of who, if we, if we enable choice of who continues flexible working and working from home and who does end up by choice going back into the office, that, that we actually need to be strategic there about making sure that that's not um, reversing some of the progress that we've made in terms of inclusion, just from who's, who's in conversations in the room, things like that. It can, leaders need to be strategic about that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I know that's a, certainly a live conversation within LSE as, as we think about how, how we come back. Um, I, I'm not sure who might want to take this one, but it's, it's currently the most popular question. It comes from Ujwa, and actually it's something that we were asked about um, that, that actually kept, was a bit of a thing yesterday when Constance spoke. Uh, which is around sort of lead, leading and influencing sort of like a, within a peer group and, and, and sideways as much as sort of downwards. So the question is, we sometimes have to work with a team of people who are our equals um, and assume a position of, of leadership. Um, how should we lead such a team without upsetting everyone else's ego and, and, and self-esteem? I don't know who wants to take that one. Who wants to take that? Jump in. I think we could all speak to this. <laughs> um, okay. Why don't I speak to the to the influencing peers point and then Sandy or Emma, please jump in about how not to, you know, step on anyone's toes. Um, I, I probably do step on people's toes, so maybe I'm not the best person to answer. I'm kidding. Um, there's some interesting research. Enzo McFarlane did some research on peer influence. It's a really great question because we do not operate in a world now where in order to drive change, we just are responsible for the team of people who report to us. To drive meaningful change, we need to actually influence across the organization and beyond that organization. So that idea of peer influence really matters. What the researchers found was that three things matter when it comes to successful peer influence. The first is what they call target assessment, which is a questionable name, I think, but nonetheless, it means giving greater consideration to those people. So thinking about 
what are their goals, what's most important to them, what are their resources, what are their challenges, um, and just spending that time to put yourself in their shoes essentially. You can do that just in five or 10 minutes. If you don't know the answers, then you know what to ask people, right? What's motivating you? What's most important to you? What's most hard for you right now? So this idea of the assessment, um, executive preparation, how much time you spend preparing for those influencing encounters. I think we can spend a lot of time preparing to influence externally and not as much time thinking about how we are influencing and influence is not a bad thing it's a it's a cornerstone of leadership so how we're influencing peers spending the time and then the third thing is influencing techniques so being strategic with how we influence are we are we just using rational persuasion or are we thinking about values and demonstrating shared goals and purpose or are we thinking about how we're um, using emotional appeals and, and, you know, to Sandy's point earlier about speaking to that, to that bigger sense of what's motivating people. So those three things really matter when it comes to influencing successfully. Sandy, well, do you want to pick up? I, I can just add a bit here because I think this comes back to the thing I was talking about when I was talking about character. Um, you know, leaders are not necessarily the people who have the title of leader in a team. Um, often the leader... Um, is somebody else, somebody who has the kind of courage and integrity and, uh, you know, everybody knows that they're the person who's really worth listening to. And that type of focus on character is really important in peer organisations, partnerships like I used to work in, uh, you know, where very quickly you get found out if you're just relying upon a scribed status. Um, and the really much more important thing is that you exhibit character and that people choose to follow you rather than being told to follow you. Right, thanks Sandy. Emma, did you have anything? Yes, sure. Um, so I agree with uh, everything Rebecca and Sandy have said, uh, but to add a couple of points, um, one about this, you know, how do you make choices and, and not step on people's toes? Um, of course, what we want to think about here, and I look at it from a decision-making point of view, is that the person who is in the role of leader or maybe no leader in this case um, with a team of peers, it, the question becomes who knows the most of, that's relevant to the situation at hand. So one view of this from a performance perspective is defer to the person with the expertise, whoever has the most expertise. And it could in fact be the most junior person in the room because they just have the knowledge of you know, working with client, being on the ground, so to speak. So that's one approach you can take in terms of where do you turn? But another is looking at decision-making techniques. And we're all familiar with the person who has the loudest voice is the one that gets heard. And this of course, is a, it's a very dominant model for all kinds of reasons. And in fact, going back to the earlier question, there are some elements of remote working that we've found certainly in our teaching have actually stopped that happening by the use of virtual tools and chat and so on. Um, so, we can think about it in the virtual context or the physical context, but it's also about how you make decisions. So it comes back to the points that we talked about earlier, create psychological safety, enable people to speak up, but also have a framework for making decisions. And this connects with what Sandy talked about with ethics, for instance. So if we think, how do we make a choice? Then we can say, okay, so what are our values? Is this a choice about customer service, right? Well, if we value customer service, then that guides our choices. So we use expertise and we use frameworks and then it becomes clearer which ideas let's take away from the conflict that could be in the room. And let's say, what are we trying to solve here and how can we best do that using expertise and guiding values as frameworks? Then you are diminishing any potential conflict in the room, but you're also enhancing the quality of the solution. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Rebecca. Some very practical tips there. I there are lots more questions, but I am very sorry to say that we are hitting one o'clock and, and there's another event about to start. So sadly, we have to draw to a close. But thank you to all, all three of you for, for your contribution to such an enlightening discussion. Thank you to everyone for coming along and your questions. Um, as a reminder, if you want to hear more from what uh, Rebecca, Emma and Sandy have to say about leadership and change, you might want to take a look at their new online certificate course. The link is there on the website now. If you want to watch back again what they said or recap 
or catch up on what we heard on decision making on Monday or making your voice heard yesterday, then you can watch all of them on YouTube and on the LSE Festival player. Um, and our next event in the series will take place tomorrow. We very much hope to see you at the same time where we will have another team of uh, LSE academics led by Dr. Robert Faulkner talking about how to manage technological disruption in the face of the fourth industrial revolution. You can register to join the event on the LSE Festival page and I very much hope to see you then. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again to Sandy, Rebecca and Emma. Um, we hope you all have a great day and hopefully see you tomorrow. Thanks very much. Bye.